hey, I'm not a hippie, I'm not right wing, anything you've read about me is mostly bullshit. <laughs> so hopefully you'll form your own opinions based on my talk today. This talk sometimes takes an hour, so I'm told the people at Stanford are really smart. So I'm going to go really fast, assuming you're all really quick studies, and that'll save more time for Q&A. So I do think we need new paradigms for the way we think about business and the way we think about capitalism. Someday the historians are going to look back on the 20th century, and they're going to see that a great war was fought between two different philosophies of economics, socialism and capitalism. Capitalism won that competition. Every place that it had the direct competition, whether it be the United States versus the Soviet Union or South Korea versus North Korea uh, or um, in any of the East Germany versus West Germany, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, it did not capture the minds of the intellectuals or the hearts of the people. Capitalism was still greatly mistrusted. And corporations, who I believe are the most influential institutions of the world, are widely perceived as greedy, selfish, and exploitative. They are certainly not worthy of any trust. You can see this very clearly with the deep uh, recession that we've been into. The, the financial crisis has been demagogued as a fault of greed and uh, uh, corporations out of control. Cap another example of capitalism not working and there's been no blame for bad government policies, bad monetary policies, bad regulations. Um, and I would argue that corporations and capitalism have serious branding problems. They are not branded very well. They don't market themselves very well in the PR uh, side of things. And what I see happening is that uh, even though capitalism won the battles in the 20, 20th century, that we're rapidly moving back towards uh, more socialism or progressivism. Uh, and I'm going to argue that there's another way, that conscious leadership, conscious business, and conscious capitalism is what we should be doing. So conscious capitalism is based on four primary uh, principles of economics, secure property rights, freedom of contract, freedom of trade, and the rule of law. Conscious capitalism is equal to these four primary economic principles plus conscious business, which leads to the question, what then is conscious business? Conscious business is based on, going in and out, in and out. Maybe I'll talk, whoa. <laughs> All right. Conscious business is based on these three primary principles of enterprise, which is what I'm going to primarily talk about. The enterprise has the potential to have a higher purpose beyond merely maximizing profits and shareholder value. The enterprise is managed to optimize value simultaneously for all of the interdependent stakeholders. And then the leadership of the organization is conscious leadership that serves the enterprise and stakeholders. If you go to a cocktail party and you ask people what the purpose of a business is, do this experiment sometime, you'll find 99% of the time People will say, what do you mean what the purpose of business is? Purpose of business is to make money. Everybody knows that. But that's kind of a curious answer. Because if you ask what the purpose of a doctor is, people aren't going to tell you, well, everybody knows the purpose of a doctor is to make money. Or if you ask what the purpose of a teacher is, no one says, well, teacher's purpose is to make money. Purpose of a doctor is to heal people. Purpose of a teacher is to educate people. Purpose of an architect, design buildings. Why is it? that we say the purpose of a business is to make money. And who defines what the purpose of a business is anyway? I'll argue that the entrepreneur who creates the business in the first place is the one who has the right to define what the purpose of that business is. And I have known hundreds, hundreds of entrepreneurs in my lifetime, and with only a few exceptions have they told me that their primary purpose was to make as much money as possible. Uh, they had a multiplicity of reasons why they started their business, and sure, they wanted to make money, but that wasn't what was driving them. I had the privilege to meet Bill Gates uh, a year or so ago, and I got to talking about this and with Bill, and uh, 
Believe it or not, he didn't start Microsoft to become the wealthiest man in the world. He was on fire about software. He had a vision of everyone having their own personal computer. And that was an incredibly revolutionary idea. Let me a quick poll here. How many people here have their own personal computer? <laughs> That's why Bill Gates is the richest man in the world, because he had a vision about that, and he pursued it with a single-mindedness and a passion. And the rest, so to speak, is history. Entrepreneurs create the original purpose of business. And in the 21st century, entrepreneurs of the conscious business are also entrepreneurs of meaning. They must determine the meaning, and they must interpret it, and they must explain it. And what I found very interesting is that although the entrepreneur may create the original purpose of the business, it's the stakeholders that ultimately evolve the purpose of the business over time. And these communities of stakeholders uh, interacting with the enterprise uh, the, the business's purpose continues to evolve. And the businesses that flourish over the long term will continue to get to either you can do a metaphor of higher and higher or deeper and deeper in terms of the meaning of what their purpose is, to higher levels of complexity and meaning. The great companies in this world have great purposes. If you think about the companies that you most admire Scratch the surface and you'll find they are trying to fulfill a deeper or higher purpose. They're not always completely conscious of it, but it resonates in their very DNA. And uh, stealing from Plato, the deepest purpose is that he was able to articulate the good, the true, and the beautiful. I added on the heroic. Um, these four categories are sufficient to explain at the most abstract level what the potential deeper purpose is that each business can try to manifest in the world. Um, if you think about a business that's serving the good or is fulfilling, pursuing the good, one of my favorite examples is Southwest Airlines, which is a tremendously, uh, uh, very, I think, very much a conscious business and uh, definitely is pursuing a deeper purpose of service to others. Uh, Nordstrom's another good example there. In terms of the true, Think about how exciting it, it must be to discover something that no one has ever known before that advances humanity. And yet that's what companies like Google have done, or Intel, or Genentech. Those are three of my favorite examples there. How about the beautiful? What's beautiful have to do with business? In a sense, a business that strives for excellence, because excellence is inherently beautiful. Uh, how about Apple? Their technology is beautiful. I think iPhones, iMacs, iPods are beautiful technology. Warren Buffett, what he's done with Berkshire Hathaway, he's made investing into something I think is an art form. It's beautiful. We talk about the heroic courage to do what is right, to change and improve the world. Um, Bill Gates at Microsoft and now with the Gates Foundation. Uh, Mohammed Yunus with the Grameen, uh, Grameen Bank are two of my favorite examples. I call this the paradox of profits. And the uh, best way to understand it is through the metaphor or the analogy of happiness. I'm now old enough to be able to speak with some authority about uh, happiness. And what I have found is that happiness is a byproduct of other things. That people who tell you that the purpose of their, that the purpose of their life is to be happy probably aren't going aren't to find it. So happiness is a, it, people that are obsessed with finding their own happiness tend to be sort of self-involved narcissists. <laughs> and that's a very bad strategy. It does not lead to ultimate happiness or fulfillment. Rather, having a deeper purpose, service, striving for excellence, growing as an individual, uh, friendship, love, generosity, these are the type of virtues that when practiced lead to happiness. Similarly, I believe that profits are best realized when they're not made the primary goal of the business, that they are also a byproduct of deeper purpose, great products and services, customer satisfaction, employee happiness, and social and environmental responsibility. The metaphors that we use to think about business are not good metaphors. Uh, one, going back to Adam Smith and the Industrial Revolution, in terms of 
business being like a machine. You put in land, labor, and capital, put it on the assembly line, and do it, and profits spit out. The Darwinian models of survival of the fittest, war metaphors, we're going to crush our competitors and roll them up. Uh, I don't think those are great uh, metaphors for really understanding business. And they, uh, metaphors do determine how we think about things. So we need to be careful in terms of the metaphors that we use to think about anything. I'm going to argue that a good metaphor to use in the 21st century is that of a complex, adaptive, self-organizing system that creates value for all of the interdependent constituencies or stakeholders. What is conscious leadership? Conscious leadership fulfill the deeper purpose of the organization, create value for the interdependent stakeholders, and to be a servant leader to the enterprise. What do I mean by servant leader? It means you're serving the enterprise and its purpose. You're not there trying to line your own pockets and see how much money you can make. Um, the true transformative leadership is serving that organization. So adopting the metaphor of a servant leader is a very appropriate metaphor. Creating value for the entire interdependent system, I will argue today, and this is my radical idea, that that will also simultaneously result in the highest long-term profits and shareholder value. I'm going to argue that Whole Foods is a conscious business. There are some other good examples right here. The only one I understand really well from the inside out is Whole Foods, so I'm going to use that as my primary example. Here's a simple model that we use to think about our business. It starts with our mission, why we exist, what our deeper purpose is, the core values. They're at the center. They're at the heart of everything we do. And they're radiating out from that heart like, like spokes on a wheel are the major interdependent stakeholders, the team members, the suppliers, the customers, the investors, and the community and the environment. This model is oversimplified because a web of all those stakeholders interacting with each other would be more appropriate, but I haven't figured out how to model that in a simplistic way yet. Um, but simply, when you allow these stakeholders to, when you manage to create value for all of them at the same time, you end up in, a, uh, in an upward spiral. So in sense, this is a circle, but a more appropriate metaphor would be to show this in an upward spiral of continued uh, uh, value creation. So conscious leadership focuses on synergies, not on the trade-offs. I'm heading off a question that I will get what about the trade-offs and the conflicts that you have between the various stakeholders? And the more you give the employees, the less money you have to give the investors. The more money you give away to not-for-profit organizations, then the less money you have for shareholder value. The higher you pay your workers, the less money there will be for investors, and so forth and so on, as if a Hobbes war against, uh, the war against all against all is in, in play here, that uh, there's this ongoing struggle between the stakeholders. The conscious leader sees the interdependencies and sees the relationships. If you look for trade-offs, you can find them. If you look for synergies, you can find them. The conscious leader looks for the synergies, looks for the strategies that will create value simultaneously for all of the interdependent stakeholders. One's creative mind does not need to think in terms of a zero-sum game. I win, you lose, you lose, I win. We can create win, win, win strategies. That is the beauty of capitalism. That is its potential, to create value for all of the ones that are voluntarily exchanging with the business. The human mind is infinitely creative. Beginning to think this way creates new mental pathways and unleashes human creativity in unexpected ways. It will be the creative entrepreneurs and the conscious capitalist who will solve the problems that the world faces in the 21st century. It's going to be that individual creativity applied collaboratively through enterprise that will solve most of the world's problems. What is Whole Foods' deepest purpose? I used to believe for many years Whole Foods' deepest purpose was the good. We're in a service business. We're to serve other people. Um, and then as I did this talk around Whole Foods, and I would, instead of giving the answer, I would poll the team members. I would say, well, I'd explain the four uh, deepest, uh, highest purposes. And then I'd take a poll, and I'd ask the team members to tell me 
what do you think the deepest purpose or highest purpose of Whole Foods is? And I got an astounding answer. And uh, it wasn't. I, I got answers for all of them. But about 75% of the team members tell me that Whole Foods' highest purpose is heroic, to, to do what is right and to change and improve the world. And I used to argue with them. I used to say, no, it's not. I created Whole Foods. That's not, that's not, that's not why I did it. It's service. It's about love. It's about service to others. No, John, that's not what it's about. So I had this argument. And then I'd go around all over the country, and finally I surrendered and said, you know what? This is a great example of the enterprise outgrowing its founder and moving in its own direction, just like a parent raises children, but eventually the child fulfills its own destiny, oftentimes in a direction different from what the parents would uh, aspire to. So I've embraced this myself. These are the seven core values of Whole Foods that are at the center of everything that we do. Just real quickly, in terms of those core values, um, selling the highest quality natural and organic foods available. We're very proud of the fact that we've been able to improve the health, wellness, and longevity of literally millions of people. We've proven that good health uh, and pleasurable eating are compatible goals. Um, alternatives to the de degradation of in, uh, industrial degradation of our food, and we've educated, or beginning to educate our stakeholders in terms of what healthy eating is all about. How many of you hope to start your own business someday? Wow, great. I'm giving you the biggest secret. It's all about the customers. <laughs> You'd be surprised how few businesses really understand that. And so if you have to design your business model first and foremost around the customers, because if you do that, you will probably win, because chances are your competitors will not be as committed to that as you will be. So they're the most important stakeholder. No customers, no business. Customers always exchange voluntarily. They're not coerced. They trade voluntarily with the enterprise. Therefore, you have to treat them as ends in themselves and not as means. We designed our business model at Whole Foods so that our team members are completely empowered to do whatever it takes to satisfy and delight the customers. Of course, the team members think they're number one. They're always disappointed when I tell them they're just the number two stakeholder to the customers. These are some of the innovations we've done. It'd be interesting to go into these in some detail, but for lack of time, I'm not. Self-managing teams, open salary information, salary cap benefits vote, gain sharing for all, stock options for all team members, personal wellness accounts, fully paid health insurance. And uh, Bill said we've been named 100 best companies to work for for 13 years in a row, number 18 in 2010. This is, oftentimes by the time I get to this part of the presentation, people think this guy's like, uh, he's like against profits. He's talking about all this other stuff. But profits are very important, and it's one of the most important reasons and functions of a business. Uh, and that profits are created through voluntary exchange. They are not primarily created through the exploitation of people. It is that voluntary exchange that fundamentally makes business ethical. No one is forced to trade. The customers aren't forced to trade. Employees aren't forced to trade. Suppliers aren't forced to trade. Investors aren't forced to invest. Everyone invests voluntarily. That's what makes it inherently ethical. Profits are the, not evil. Profits are good. Profits create wealth, they create capital, and they create prosperity. Capital is the fuel for all the technological progress the world has ever known. Without that fuel, there would be no progress. Whole Foods has tried to do its part. We've been the fastest growing uh, publicly traded uh, food retailer for the past 10 years. Uh, Eight billion in sales. Our same store sales have averaged 9%. Our return on invested capital is 35%. Uh, EBITDA, compound annual growth rate, 30% a year since we went public in 1992. Our stocks increased 1,400% since our IP, uh, 1992 IPO, even though uh, it traded down tremendously in 19, 2007 and 2008. I say one of the most important functions of business is to create prosperity. Business has a fundamental responsibility to create prosperity for society and indeed for the entire world. Do you realize that less than 200 years ago, 85% of the people alive on the planet Earth lived on less than a dollar a day? And that's in today's dollars. 85%. We're down to 20%. That's progress. That's what business has done. That is what capitalism has done. No, it's terrible that we still have over a billion people on this planet that live on less than a dollar a day, 
but that's still only about 20% instead of 85%. If we don't screw it up, we will end poverty on the planet Earth in the 21st century. There are people young enough in this audience today that will live to see that. As Muhammad Yunus says, someday poverty will be something people only see in museums. This is one of the heroic things that business is doing. It is creating wealth. It is creating prosperity, and it is lessening poverty. In the last 15 years alone, in India and China, literally hundreds of millions of people have been able to escape from poverty. I do not believe suppliers are supposed to be beaten up. I believe they're partners with the business. And business has to create win-win relationships with, uh, their, with their suppliers. And I'm very proud of the fact that all these little tiny mom and pa suppliers, they're all millionaires now. Most of them sold out and sort of sad they sold out to big corporations. But uh, I'm happy they got wealthy and Whole Foods certainly uh, contributed to that. And they contributed to our success. We wouldn't be what we were today without the growth of our suppliers. I don't know whether you're aware of it or not, but there's a complete renaissance going on about local agriculture in the United States. And it's very exciting. Whole Foods is trying to contribute to that. We've made, we have a local loan program. We've, made, uh, we've loaned up $3 million to small producers around the United States, Canada, and the UK. We're also trying to work with small, uh, uh, poor farmers around the world. Our whole trade guarantee, we did over $200 million in 2009 in whole trade goods. We work with a variety of partners. Um, this is a good thing. So I do think that business has responsibility to be, uh, to be responsible for the communities and environment. And I think that citizenship is the appropriate metaphor, that business should be good citizens in whatever communities they do business in. Good citizens in their local communities, their national communities, and the global communities. I think philanthropy is consistent with citizenship. And I also believe that philanthropy is not theft from the shareholders. It needs to be managed just as you manage any other part of the business. It needs to be done intelligently. But if done intelligently, it creates a win-win-win strategy that creates value for all of the stakeholders, including the shareholders. In Whole Foods' case, we donate at minimum a 5% of our profits to not-for-profit organizations. 90% of that is done locally in our stores. We support literally thousands and thousands of not-for-profit organizations each year. We also have a foundation called the Whole Planet Foundation. Um, this is commitment of our global uh, citizenship. We work with Mohammed Yunus and the Grameen Bank to make these microcredit loans. We've, um, these are the countries we currently work in. These are communities that we're actually trading in. So we don't just do these randomly. It's wherever our business is trading in the developing world, we look to eventually set up a microcredit uh, operation. And 98% uh, of our loans have been to women, 98% repayment, no collateral, uh, no contracts. Uh, we've now made over 57,000 loans, over $10 million. And we just, uh, I, I underline Haiti because we just doubled our commitment to Haiti uh, as a result of the earthquake. And uh, so we're up to a million dollars now in Haiti in our, our microcredit loans. Eventually, we're going to cover the planet, this program. This is an example of win-win philanthropy, win-win-win philanthropy. There's no single thing our company has ever done in our 30-year history that has created better team member morale than this. So for a mere $10 million, we've received hundreds of millions of dollars of goodwill with our team member base and with our customers. We've engaged our suppliers in what we call supplier alliances so that they're also investing in the, uh, uh, in the Whole Planet Foundation, as well as give our customers opportunities to make contributions. Whole Foods cares deeply about our environment. We support local, organic, and sustainable agriculture. Sustainable seafood is one of the environmental issues you don't hear much about, which is unfortunate. It's a serious problem. Um, we worked with Marine Stewardship Council. We have farmed uh, uh, fish standards, and we're striving towards complete transparency for in our sustainability. Whole Foods is one of the largest re, uh, uh, companies in the, in the world, uh, d committed to alternative energy, committed to green building. We have store green mission teams, um, committed to animal welfare standards. Again, environmental strategy should be thought of as a win-win-win strategy that benefits all of the stakeholders. 
We're launching this year in 2010 our five-step animal welfare rating program. Look for that in our stores. We created a, originally this was a foundation we started ourselves. Uh, it was called the Animal Compassion Foundation. We've decided, we worked with the animal welfare groups like Humane Society, PETA, Animal Welfare International. We decided to take the, uh, make this a public foundation and globalize it. We want our five-step animal welfare system. We're going to, uh, rather than monopolize those standards, we're giving those standards that we've created. We've worked on it for five years to create our standards. We're giving those up, uh, to hopefully, for every, everybody, everybody else to begin to use. Um, more time, I'd go into more detail about this system. No time. Conscious capitalism and not-for-profit organizations. What does this have to do with not-for-profit organizations? Not-for-profits get one of the most important aspects of conscious business. They understand the importance of having a higher purpose and having a mission. That's their gift that they have to teach the for-profit sector. However, nonprofits are not able to transcend self-interest. You don't become an angel just because you work for a nonprofit or work for the government. Um, oftentimes, there's an anti-profit mentality that severely cr cripples, creates inefficiencies, waste, and stagnation. Therefore, many not-for-profit organizations are not sustainable over the long run, uh, and they need to learn from corporations about surviving and flourishing. So I argue they need to also evolve to a more holistic model. This is the model of a conscious nonprofit organization. Does it look familiar? <laughs> it should. It looks, it's exactly the same as the conscious enterprise model that I showed with Whole Foods. The only difference is that in, at the core, you've got a social mission as opposed to necessarily a business mission. And instead of investors, you have donors. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same model. This s illustrates to me the flaw in the thinking that many people have about nonprofits, government, and corporations. We believe that because nonprofits have a higher purpose, that they are good, they're altruistic. They do all types of wonderful things. Um, on the other side of the wall, we have corporations. And they are greedy. They are selfish. They only care about profit. I want to tear this wall down. This way of thinking is not going to serve humanity in the 21st century. We've got to tear this wall down. This exaggerated polarity and dualism between egoism and altruism is false. Human beings are both self-interested and we're capable of love. We don't need a win-lose metaphor or lose-win metaphor. We need win-win-win metaphors. Creative love, love of self, and love of others is the golden Aristotelian mean that breaks down the dichotomy between egoism and altruism. You can see that the upward spiral of caring it starts with yourself, moves to your family, then to your friends, then to your tribe or your community or your company, potentially moving to your race or your nation, potentially then expanding on to humanity as a whole. Possibly your ability to empathize can extend to all mammals, perhaps even to all sentient beings, and perhaps even to all life. That is the potential that humanities have, humanity has. Conscious business is not the same thing as CSR. They are different. Um, on the left, you see corporate social responsibility. It's very consistent. CSR is very consistent with the traditional business model. It's consistent because shareholders still rule instead of stakeholders. It has nothing to do with the corporate purpose. It still has a traditional mechanistic view of business. It's usually an add-on, just an add-on, something they graft onto the business. Eh, we're getting a lot of stuff about the CSR stuff. We can get some good publicity. Uh, let's create a CSR department. Oftentimes, it reports up through the public relations department. Um, so it's when businesses and corporations get accused of greenwashing, 
oftentimes the accusation is correct. It is a simple form of greenwashing. Whereas the conscious business, the social mission, the environmental mission are at the very essence, the very core, at the heart of why the business exists in the first place. It's not a grafting on. Instead, it's at the, the purpose, the center. Uh, you can meet the CSR through, um, uh, through a, chari a charitable gesture can meet that, but the conscious business requires a genuine transformation. The CSR assumes that all good deeds are equally uh, desirable, but in the conscious business, the good deeds should correlate back to the advancing the company's core mission. Here's what I want to see happen in the 21st century, that we will evolve from this to this, from profit focus to purpose focus, from only shareholding, shareholders winning to all stakeholders winning, from short-term to long-term, from zero-sum to win-win-win strategies, from self-centered to holistic, from conflicts of interest to synergies, or uh, to harmony of interest, parasitic to mutualistic, from exploitative to creating value, from trade-offs to synergies, from disliked to valued and loved, and from not trusted to trusted. Conscious business and conscious uh, capitalism are new paradigms for the 21st century. To just sum it up, you have to support capitalism. The conscious capitalist still supports the key economic uh, rights that underlie all capitalism, property rights, freedom of contract, freedom to trade, and the rule of law. The conscious business goes further, identifies a deeper purpose beyond maximizing profits and shareholder value. The enterprise is then managed in such a way to create value simultaneously for all of the interdependent stakeholders. The leadership becomes conscious uh, to the enterprise and serves its mission and its stakeholders. We transform the underlying ethics of the enterprise to a win, 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 win philosophy. This allows, finally, for business and capitalism to do what human beings want it to do, which is aspire to fulfill the deepest aspirations that humanity has, the good, the true, the beautiful, and the heroic. Thank you very much. All right, I did save a little time for questions. I did rapidly go through a lot of that stuff. So, how are we doing the questions? Or am I gonna call on people? Are the mics gonna get passed around? You got the mics, great. So just fire away. Great, thank you so much, John. Um, as we are mostly uh, focused on startups around here, we get a lot of founders and entrepreneurs that come in. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they speak of uh, finding a company, running it until it gets to a certain size, and then the investors or board decide that it'd be better to have someone perhaps with industry experience to come in and run it. And now your story is very different. And so I guess from a perspective of a leadership question, what were specific leadership challenges that you had while your company grew underneath you and you went from being a founder to a small business owner to you know, the CEO of Whole Foods? Well, there's 30 years of history there. So um, I will say that if you start your own business, I, I came up with a metaphor for venture capitalists. They don't like it too much, but I think it's a pretty good metaphor. They're like hitchhikers. They're hitchhikers with credit cards. <laughs> and as long as you get them to where they want to go, they will help pay for the gas. However, if you get off track, they hijack the car, they hire a new driver, and they throw you out on the side of the road. <laughs> we never gave a venture capitalist control of Whole Foods. Uh, we went public probably a little earlier than we would have uh, ordinarily gone because we needed to raise more capital. If we'd done another round, the VCs would have gotten control of the company. So we went ahead and fire ready aim uh, became public. Probably you couldn't even become public as small as Whole Foods was back in 1992. Uh, it wouldn't be possible today. In terms of the challenges, I, there's so many of them, I wouldn't even know where to begin. I will say, though, that in the essence to your question, you have to grow as a human being and as a leader or you hold your business back. Um, I've been forced to grow reluctantly at many times because uh, if I hadn't, um, the company wasn't gonna reach its full potential. So 
it's essential that you continue to get not only smarter, but that you develop your emotional intelligence. I always say for leadership, emotional intelligence is more important than in, uh, IQ. And I would argue that social intelligence, and I would also argue spiritual intelligence, spiritual intelligence being the ability to understand purpose and meaning and to be able to explain that and translate it are essential uh, intelligences that the entrepreneurs of the 21st century need. So you're going to face many challenges as you grow your business. First challenge is, of course, is money. You've got to have to get the money. You've got to have the capital. So you've got to deal with cash flow. Then as you grow, you have to be able to create structures that simultaneously allow, allow the business to fulfill its potential but without hamstringing it. Uh, so they have to be flexible structures that can evolve. Um, I mean, if we, had, if we sat on one-on-one, -on -one, I could go over it in some detail. But there, there are different stages that a business goes through and different crises that a business meets. And just like as you go through your own life cycle, you'll have different crises. When you're early 20s, it's like finding a partner and finding work. That, you, you, that's your crisis. When you get into your 30s, you're raising kids. You get into you know, 40s and 50s, it's starting to be about generative and what your legacy is going to be, and, and that's all I've gotten so far. So um, when I, <laughs> I get a little older, I'll find out what the next crisis is. Probably body falling apart. <laughs> Despite Whole Foods, it hasn't, I don't think it's made me immortal. So um, I'll deal with my own problems. Next question. So um, the Supreme Court recently came down on the side of effectively letting corporations play a more active role in public political discourse, and the liberal wing of the court, I'm over here. Where are you? There you are. <laughs> so the, the liberal wing, oh, I can sit up. The liberal wing of the court made a distinction between corporate speak and, and individual speak. And I was wondering where you come down on the side of that debate, both in terms of Whole Foods and kind of the prevailing business atmosphere in terms of, excuse me, whether uh, that new opportunity may be used more opportunistically by others than it might be by Whole Foods. You know, every time I ever take on a political question, uh, I get totally slammed in the media. So uh, on the other hand, I aspire to authenticity. So what am I supposed to do? <laughs> Let me try to be cagey on this one uh, and authentic. Um, I don't believe that media corporations, such as the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and Forbes, uh, that they should have the right for freedom of speech because they own media assets. And uh, other corporations, therefore, don't because they don't own media, media assets. So as a general rule, I don't think corporations are eager to, uh, you pay a price when you speak out publicly. I, trust me, I found that out this summer. So I, I don't think this ruling, I, I do think it's consistent with freedom of speech. And I'd, I, I, I was happy with the ruling. So. Uh, mostly because I, I don't think it's going to be all the negative things that people believe is going to happen. Is going to happen. But time will tell. Next question. Uh, so you might have to be cagey again here. Um, I don't so want to talk about climate change or health care reform. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so uh, I don't necessarily agree with this argument, but I want to see how you respond to the argument. Why not simply have government enforce the conscious capitalism uh, that you're advocating for, whether that be, you know, subsidizing green projects or healthcare reform or whatnot? Uh, well, because I might be wrong. <laughs> I mean, um, people believe that if they had ultimate power, they would be good. And uh, I, don't, I don't believe in a society where government is, is legislating a particular vision on the way people should live, even if I happen to be my vision. Uh, I believe in a, in a pluralistic society where we get to experiment. Uh, and that one of the secrets to Whole Foods is we're a very experimental company. We try things. Most of them fail. But we throw out the failures, and we continue to learn and evolve. So I believe in a society that's, that's democratic and uh, allows. I believe conscious capitalism, by the way, is going to triumph at the end of the 21st century. Why? Not because government has to pass any laws to force people to be that way, because it works better. It's going to win in the marketplace. It's going to win in competition. So these ideas need to be tried out. And if they work, they'll, they'll flourish and expand. If they don't work, they'll be thrown in the trash bin of, uh, of history. 
And having government pick winners for business philosophies is a very bad idea. First of all, because they probably won't pick the ideas that you agree with anyway. So I don't want to live in a society where government is uh, telling us how businesses should operate. I think that the marketplace should determine that. Hi. Uh, can you talk about some of the difficult decisions you've had to make with your supply chain when you, as Whole Foods has grown over the past 20 years? Uh, could you give me a little more color on that? I mean, what, In terms of maintaining the integrity of what you wanted in a supplier when you first started the business versus what you can get as you've scaled uh, to be such a large company. The first crisis of faith at Whole Foods was when we realized our suppliers were mostly, uh, weren't they, um, they weren't as good as their marketing materials indicated. Uh, that's a disillusionment of a retailer because uh, as we got in there and looked beneath the kimono, so to speak, uh, uh, a lot of what we saw was uh, not that pretty. For example, in the meat industry, if you really knew what they were doing to those animals out there, you'd probably all become vegetarians or vegans. Uh, it's terrible. And as we've gotten into the process and we've seen more, so that's the first challenge is uh, w the retailer's the middleman, right, between the farmer, the rancher, the manufacturer, and the consumer. And the consumer trusts us to, uh, to deliver what the manufacturer claims. They blame us if it's not. So that was the first challenge that we had, and it's an ongoing challenge. We have, to, we have to look very deeply at our supply chain and determine whether or not uh, it's, it's what it's cracked up to be. That it, and so we're doing lots of things now, like we have our animal welfare rating system. We're going to put all of our, everybody we buy meat from, which is thousands and thousands of people, will have to get, every, will have to get rated in terms of the way they treat their animals so we can give transparency to our customers. Seafood sustainability is another one uh, that uh, is very important, and people are not aware that so many of the species they buy in seafood departments are not sustainable, and yet the retailers are not telling the customers that, so they're, not, they're keeping that as a secret. So we're going we're gonna to basically be much more transparent about that. There's all kinds of... Uh, the first organic supplier Whole Foods bought from, for example, anecdotally here, was a company in... A, uh, Southern California, it was called Sunburst Farms. And you read their marketing materials, they're organic, they're this community living there, and it looks like they're lo love and peace and joy, and it seems like a really wonderful thing. We, checked, we got into it, we checked them out, and it uh, turns out they were like uh, uh, the guy that was, uh, was a cult leader, and they were a survivalist group that had a whole, whole bunch, they were, they were uh, stocking up guns for Armageddon that was coming. And, in fact, uh, they weren't selling that much organic produce. It was mostly, uh, uh, they were taking, uh, they had organic boxes and they were taking commercial produce and sticking it in the organic boxes and shipping it out. So there was a lot of fraud that we had to deal with. Uh, now we're in this enviable position, I suppose, that we've gotten large enough where we can go uh, work with our suppliers in a more transparent way to assure ourselves and our customers that the people are really getting what they've been promised. So if you're smaller, it's a lot harder to do that. So there is fraud that, that goes on in business, I, I'm sorry to say. And uh, so that was one of our challenges we had to deal with. Let's, next question. Hi, John, off here to your right. Um, Stan, uh, great. Originally, uh, uh, my family's been Whole Foods shoppers for 20 years, so we're big fans. And I also was a former uh, front-end team leader at your Richardson, Texas store. So got and a look how far you've come. There, so. <laughs> We made it all the way, so big fans, thanks for your time. Question for you, about 10 to 15 years ago, it seemed like there was a shift from Whole Foods started stocking Lay's potato chips, some conventional items, and it seemed like there might have been a shift in you know, the culture or the core business segment you guys were going after, and then a few years later went back and eliminated those products and focused more on organics. Just trying to figure out what kind of the thinking was of the company at that two-year period, and then kind of where you guys went from there. Well, you can't understand Whole Foods unless you understand how decentralized and empowered we are. That was not a decision that was made in Austin, Texas for the whole company. That was probably made locally in a, uh, in a store or a region, and it was done as an experiment. So the um, experiment was taken, went out, and customers didn't like it, and the experiment was judged a failure. But that was, a, that was not a company-wide experiment. So again, most of our experiments, uh, they most of them fail, but, and that was one I would argue that, that that, that failed, but 
it was important that the region and the store get a chance to test that idea out. I, it might be disillusioning, but again, most of the suppliers that were in the early days, they've mostly sold out to, to like PepsiCo, Frito-Lay, Coca-Cola, Kraft, General Foods. Most of the natural food labels now are in, in, in the hands of uh, those larger food manufacturers, and um, there's less transparency there than there should be. And Whole Foods, of course, has got a much greater commitment to our private label now at this point. Uh, Trader Joe's is like 85, 90% private label, and Whole Foods is only about uh, 20%. So uh, I don't think there was any lasting cultural change, but there is continued evolution in the, in the supply chain that we have to deal with. So I don't know. Leonard Green's investment in Whole Foods in 2008 and how you came to the decision to take private equity capital and how that partnership has uh, your business to evolve over the last year. Good question. Uh, we bought, the Wild Oats merger has worked out extremely well for us, but the timing of it was terrible. Uh, when we, of course, then we got in the whole FTC thing and what a hassle that was and how much money we wasted on that, but another story. But um, when we bought Wild Oats, the market, we were kind of at our peak stock price. We paid cash for them. And in order to do that, we had to go borrow money. So we took on a lot of debt, more debt than we'd ever taken on our company's history. But we didn't think it'd be any big deal because uh, we thought we would we'd sell stock in a, in a couple of months and uh, pay, off, pay down the debt. But then our, the economy started going into the tank. But first of all, the, the merger got put off many, many months while they had to go through the regulatory processes. Then, um, uh, then our stock started to decline because the economy was declining and our sales were declining. And so we didn't want to sell stock. And then, what, September 2008, you can remember that time, I've never, that was a panic. That's the only panic I'm old enough to live through and I'm probably the oldest guy in the room. So it's a, uh, every, everything went to hell. And our sales started plummeting. Our stock went down to $7. We were trading at two times our cash flow. Could have bought Whole Foods and got a 50% return on cash flow alone. I was begging, please let me buy back stock. Please let me buy back stock. But the board, in their infinite wisdom, um, uh, realize that what if it's not the bottom? What if it's not the bottom? What if it gets worse? And so that was a good point of view. And we realized we, we took the money in from Leonard Green as an insurance policy. That's what it was. It was an insurance policy. And the event Armageddon was really happening. We wanted to survive. And it turns out we didn't actually need the capital. Armageddon did not happen. Uh, deepest recession of my lifetime happened, but not Armageddon. Um, but you know what? Leonard Green's been a great, uh, great investor. They own 17% of the company, and uh, they don't control it, but they've been very valuable on the board. They do take a long-term perspective. They love us, I guess because we've already made like $500 million for them in a year. So uh, I, one of my jokes is, is that when the stock is up, I'm this visionary, and when the stock is down, I'm like the village idiot. <laughs> Your reputation waxes and wanes based on the, on the stock price. But with Leonard Green, I'm visionary because they've made so much money. So um, I'm glad we did it. It was an insurance policy that I'm glad we didn't have to collect on. How is that? Uh, and I would, but I think they are, you can hear lots of bad things about private equity firms. Leonard Green is uh, an outstanding firm with great integrity. I'm proud to be associated with them. I hope that gets printed in the newspaper. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you.